Hello, um, today we're going to talk about tips for pro se um, petitioners. Okay, so there's a petitioner and the respondent. Uh, petitioner is going to be the person who files the motion, um, which can be anything. It can be a motion for a restraining order. It can be a motion for, um, uh, you know, child custody. It could be a motion for child support. Whoever files those packets of paperwork first is now known as the petitioner. Um, so that's what we'll be kind of tailoring these tips to. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just apologize for my appearance. I'm a very tired mama today. <laughs> it's been lots of school and lots of work and lots of, um, everything. So especially jujitsu. Uh, so it's just been, I've been a little bit all over the board. So here we go. We're going to dive right in. Um, the first tip is going to be, and some of these might sound obvious, but you'd, you'd be surprised when we're going through the eye of the storm, how often, we kind of forget our basics. So that's kind of what this video is about, um, just to kind of reroute to some more basic tips and tricks um, and just keep our heads right in the game as we go through the the legal process of, you know, the, the legal pursuit of child custody and child support, if you will. Um, and we're doing this together, so why not? Uh, the first tip, it's going to be to read everything that we get from the court as well as the other side right away. This includes uh, the paperwork that we get from the clerk's office when we file. It's really, really important to know um, what's going on in our case. A lot of times when you file a motion in some states and some counties, they will have a hearing date maybe scheduled for you right away. It might be sort of that structure where it's like, okay, we filed it. Um, maybe Tuesday is the only time we see family law and maybe Wednesday is when we see traffic court, you know, such and such. So they might have a day and time for you available immediately. Chances are probably not. The clerk has to go through the paperwork and approve it to be filed. Um, and when it's not approved, I cannot stress this enough. If it doesn't get approved your first go around as pro se, I remember mine took like four or five attempts. It took forever. So don't be discouraged. Go through with the court clerk and all your sticky notes um, and write down, you know, because they'll have errors and, and things that they want to see fixed. Sticky note it right next to where it needs to get fixed and write on the sticky note what exactly it is. Because by the end of the process, you might get a little like confused, exhausted, exasperated, all the above. So write the sticky note down. Um, and then also with a direct, you know, bullet point, maybe or an arrow. I did arrows on mine and it was like, okay, here is where my exhibit goes and put it right there. Um, so definitely do that. But for sure, for sure. Step number one, read over everything we get. If we get a receipt from the court, it's going in your fancy uh, log binder that I hope you have by now at this point in time. You should have a binder where you're tracking everything, text, calls, emails, screenshots, videos, you name it. Everything should be tracked. So get that binder set up. Um, I know I've harped on you guys a lot about it in previous videos. Don't forget it. The second point, um, the second tip is going to be to meet every deadline. It's so tricky with pro se court. Um, with pro se court, if you have a motion filed and let's say you have a court date, um, maybe work doesn't let you get out of it. I hate to say this, but you really have to weigh out, you know, which one is, is more important at times. Society is not designed for single parents. Um, it's really not, as, let alone a single parent who's representing themselves in a courtroom in a whole other dimension, basically. So deadlines are so, so, so important. If we, if we don't know exactly how to do something, we need to try to get help um, in order to do our best. It's more important to file and submit the required documents and responses on time than to do everything perfectly. And this is 100% true. So let's say if you get slapped with a motion for whatever, um, there will be a period of time in that paperwork that says respondent has, I don't know, 35 days to respond to motion. Um, you have to know those deadlines and you should not be waiting until day, you know, 30, 31. Don't even think about 33, 34, 35, because they may not get approved for a couple days to even go into the court records. So um, if you're getting hit with motions, as the respondent side of things, you have to read over that paperwork and really make sure that you have your deadlines locked in um, on your calendar. Back referring to the logbook, you should have a calendar for our, uh, every month section with all the 30, 31 days, 28 days for Feb, uh, February. 
You should have all your court dates written down, times, and the rooms too. Nobody thinks about that. Courts have different rooms. Sometimes it's based on the judge. Sometimes it's based on the category of the court uh, hearing, like if it's family court, if it's legal court, something like that. Um, they might be in different rooms. So you have to know the, the room number before you go. You need to have all that planned out and scheduled. And then the day of, this is just a side, you know, little tidbit, but the day of, go there early, get your room organized, go check in with the clerk, make sure you have the correct room number. Maybe it said 313 a week and a half ago, but now it says, you know, 215, whatever it might be. Check in, make sure the day of, morning of, whatever, within the hour that you have the right courtroom and that you're sitting in the right spot. Okay. Um, you can lose cases if you do miss these deadlines, if more time is needed, um, in order to actually, you know, complete something within the court case, then you can always ask the court in writing for more time. As soon as you know, um, this would be a good time to go to the court clerk for that. They should be relatively simple. If the clerk is not helpful, I've seen your guys's comments. I know that court clerks can be gnarly to say the least, um, maybe lackluster, minimal help. Um, the system's not designed to actually help us. It's designed to be in and out the door, uh, because the way that I, it makes me feel is that people going through the family court system are an inconvenience on judges. They want to see everybody get in and get out. They don't really seem to believe that anybody has a serious story when it comes to domestic violence, which is really, really unfortunate. Um, but at the same time, it is what it is. So if you need more time, go to the court clerk. If you don't want to deal with the court clerk, go to the self-help center. Um, a lot of times, a lot of forms are now kept online as well. So you can go Google your state um, and then the, you know, maybe self-help forms, um, your state and then like legal forms, I think was a term that I've used. Um, and you should be able to see like an e-file link or something to that effect. Click around. Definitely leave me a comment if there's something odd that you noticed or something that I didn't list. I would love to do some research on it just so that I'm a little bit well versed in other states as well. Uh, the third tip Using our own words, okay? This does not mean cuss words. This does not mean slang. Words should be spelled appropriately in order to be taken seriously. Um, we don't need to sound like an attorney at all. When we sound like an attorney, it's kind of like we're speaking a foreign language without knowing the context really well. So it's kind of like maybe broken Spanish would be a good way to explain that. So when we do things like implementing statutes in the video I published, I think last week, um, you really have to put the actual quotation. So let's say that you're requesting full custody based off of a domestic violence implication, um, or charges or, you know, conviction, something like that. You have to put, again, CRS is just the, the Colorado where we live, the Colorado statutes, um, Colorado regulatory statutes, I think. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. Again, this isn't legal help. This is just I'm, I'm sorry, legal advice. This is just a single parent talking to other single parents um, about different experiences. So reference the CRS when we do our, when we use our own words, um, say as per CRS, ORS, WRS, whatever it might be in quotations, the actual statute that had been violated. Um, and the judge can kind of take it from there. You don't have to go into a whole synopsis of like, you know, August 12th, this and that happened and December 1st, such and such happened, you know, something to that effect. You can always just use the statutes. And when it comes time for your pro se hearing, um, then explain how it connects. You want to have those written down as well, because we don't want to get foggy brain the day of, um, and kind of freeze up and lock up in front of a judge. That wouldn't be good. So write all, write your bullet points down, keep copies of the paperwork, what I did was I kept copies of the motion that I filed so I could see exactly what it was that the judge was reading. And then I would put sticky notes on there and reference the, um, you know, the, the bullet points that I had planned out at this, at the same time. A lot of this is hindsight 2020 for me. These are, I build videos based off of some things that I wish I could have done better. Um, or I wish that I had done more research on. It's hard when you're in the thick of it to do adequate research in my opinion. So that's kind of why this channel was born anyways. So, um, if we're citing CRS, uh, or us, 
you know, WRS, whatever it might be, we have to explain to the court why this applies um, to our case. So that's what I mentioned earlier when it's like, okay, as per CRS, blah, blah, in quotations, the actual quote from the law. And then when the judge asks us about it, that's when we can uh, explain the similarities between that and our cases. Okay. Tip number four, always keep our paperwork and stay organized. I know this sounds basic, but life catches up with us. We got work, we got kids, we got school, we got the whole nine. We're dealing with you know, the constant cyber harassment, legal abuse, maybe financial abuse, maybe verbal abuse, all this stuff is still happening around us. So it's easy for us to set it, you know, set the paperwork on our, you know, passenger seat and just kind of forget about it. And then it gets, I don't know if you're like me, get drive through grease leaks on it or something like that. It becomes a mess. File it right away. As soon as you get paperwork, as soon as you get a receipt from daycare, anything, that needs to be filed and logged right away. Don't mess around. Do not risk losing it. Don't even bother with that. Okay. It needs to get put away appropriately. We have to keep paper uh, or electronic copies of everything we send to and or file with the court. Okay. Everything. Also, we need to keep everything that we receive from the court and the other side as well, or anyone else re uh, relating to our case. When we file a paper in the clerk's office, we need to bring at least the original and two copies so that we can keep a stamped copy for ourselves. Courthouses will issue you an official copy. Um, sometimes it'll have like a blue stamp or like a, I forget what it's called, but like a little press thing. I know you guys know what I'm talking about, a little press thing. Um, and it'll like indent the paper and it'll be an original copy. Um, so we need to keep those. We also need to know where they're located so that we can use them to work on our own case because we are our own help in this circumstance. Okay. Um, the fifth tip, have anyone else read our papers before we submit or file them? We need to be sure that the person understands what we wrote. And if not, we have to rewrite those, um, you know, statements or subjectives to try and explain ourselves more clearly. Okay. The judge may not hear us, um, sorry, hear us explain ourselves in person and may, excuse me, and may rely on our paperwork when we're making decisions, when they're making decisions on our case. This is true. This is hundred percent true. Sometimes it's, you know, a, 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 you know, sink or swim type of situation. Sometimes when we file paperwork, it's either, um, you know, denied at the door and we have to come back and file it again which is why I tell you guys to bug the clerks and go to the self-help centers and pull out all the stops that you can. Um, and sometimes it's approved and um, like acknowledged, I guess, immediately. Typically on different motions, it'll, it'll have a time frame that they give the respondent to respond to the court papers. But I mean, sometimes not. Sometimes it's just you know, maybe a pattern of behavior is triggering the judge to just say like, okay, this is, this is kosher. Like this is within reason. Let's just approve it. It just happens. Um, so we need to be sure that we're articulating ourselves on paperwork very clearly. Okay. Uh, the sixth tip is to be sure that the court always has our correct address and phone number. I cannot stress this enough. Um, if our contact information changes, we have to contact the clerk's office in writing immediately. Always include our case number on the paperwork um, that we submit to the courthouse. So you can have like a formal address change and stuff filed like that. Um, I know for Colorado, a lot of it is based over e-file and Zoom and stuff like that. Um, and so if your address isn't right, your email isn't right, um, excuse me, I'm so sorry, your phone number isn't right, you may miss a hearing. So somebody might file something and completely get away with it because you didn't get the documents in the mail. This is very, very important. This not having your address updated, not being on top of your postage, not answering your phone, anything like that is it could be so detrimental to your case. You have to have everything updated all the time so that they can get a hold of you if they need to. Okay. I cannot stress that enough. That would be such a simple way 
such a frustrating mistake for, for, uh, because like if something gets filed and a motion gets granted because we never received anything in the mail, um, which likely won't happen with abusers because they're always bragging about themselves. Right. So if anything gets filed in court, they're, they're going to be the first ones to tell on you. It's just who they are. They're just so grandiose about everything, um, that they just cannot possibly keep their mouth shut about stuff. And so, you know, it just, just, it's, it's just not even, not even worth messing around with. If, if, if they file something and it goes unheard of, unresponded to, they win. Now we're fighting the uphill battle from the trenches because we're pro se again. We don't have an attorney to help us. Now we're fighting an uphill battle all over again and we're right back to reset. We don't want to go to reset. Okay. We want to just have our plan of attack and get after it. You know what I mean? Okay, seven. Uh, tip number seven, omit certain personal identifying information from documents submitted to the court for filing. All the documents within the court will be available to the public on the internet. We have to protect our privacy and that of other individuals uh, that you refer to in our documents, which reminds me, let me pull this up on Google really quick. Um, some states have what's called an address confidentiality program. And I wanted to read those out to you guys, because if you live in these states, you can definitely get this applied for, especially if you have a history of domestic violence, if you're a survivor, um, or, you know, a current victim, whatever you might need. Um, if you're a current victim and they know where you live, I still suggest it. So with the address confidentiality program, what happens is it's a program that overrides the judge. So while the abuser might say like, I need to know where she lives because I want to know where my kids are getting taken to and all this stuff, the ACP will protect you with that. They literally override the judge and they just tell the judge like, what's up? Basically, they submit an order. It's not a motion. They're not asking the judge for permission. They submit an order that just says as per Arizona state or California state, um, the, you know, petitioner is in, enrolled in the address confidentiality program. So now if you have something like, um, maybe you have in your parenting agreement or, you know, you've already done a couple things, so you have child custody orders in place or whatever that overrides all of that. You don't have to give up your address for anything. There's now a court order, a legal court order filed into your case, and not even the judge can take that away. That's They can probably try, but you would have pretty good grounds for a lawsuit if anything happened. It would be silly. Um, Okay, so the states that do have ACP, the Address Confidentiality Program, okay? Uh, Arizona, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, District of Columbia, Florida, Idaho, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, surprisingly, they're very Republican. Louisiana, also very Republican, but they have it. Uh, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, Tennessee, Texas, Vermont, Virginia, Washington, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. Okay. If you live in any of the states that I just said, you need to go hop over to the address confidentiality program. Okay. Just Google it. And with your state name in the, in the search box, um, and you should be able to find a good link that will have it. It might show up as like the, the, um, oh my gosh, department of, you know, personnel division, central services, uh, ACP safe at home is another, um, resource that, that do it. Mine was like through like blue bench, I think is what it was called, uh, for Colorado. Look into this. I'm telling you, um, it will help you substantially. Not only that, but it's also showing the judge that a third party recognizes that you have been involved in domestic violence and you qualify for some extra resources. So they gave them to you. There's no harm, no foul. Give it a shot. Okay, so these tips that I went over today for pro se help, these are all actually filed in um, this uh, representing yourself in district court handbook for pro se litigants. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and post the link to this, um, you know, uh, 
a little handbook if you want. It does get sometimes, you know, challenging, but it's okay. Um, and just take a look at this book. See if any of it's helpful for you. You know, take some downtime to search through it. See if there's anything that maybe you could, um, you know, kind of connect with. Stuff like that. We'll go over more of this um, later in the month. But for now, I'm just super happy that you guys are cruising my channel. I'm super happy to help anybody. I can't believe how much growth this has experienced. If you have any other kind of wonky points of advice or anything, any challenges that you face, please, please, please leave me a comment in any of the videos. I try to review them pretty regularly. Um, and I can definitely do a video on something that you guys pick out for sure. So just let me know. All right, thanks. Have a good day. You got this. I can't believe that you came into my life. You made me feel again. Now it's my turn. You say you.